I speak to you in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all life. Amen. Amen. As Martha said at the welcome, today is commonly known as Good Shepherd Sunday. And that's pretty clear from the gospel reading that Matt just read for us. And as also noted, we are celebrating our patronal festival of St. George. And St. George's Day is April the 23rd, which was this past Friday. In the church calendar, today, April 25th, is also St. Mark's Day. That's St. Mark, uh, the author, uh, the supposed author of the Gospel of Mark. Mark, or John Mark, as uh, he also gets called in Scripture. So, my magic trick for this morning, if you will, uh, after I pull a rabbit out of my hat, um, sorry, cheap jokes, cheap tricks, um, after I pull the rabbit out of my hat is to try and connect all three of those points with today's gospel reading. And there's one more, because yesterday in the church calendar was also the commemoration, of the memorial of the martyrs of the 20th century. Now, that memorial, while certainly referring to any Christian uh, who was killed because of their faith in the 20th century, has some pretty specific uh, mentions and uh, incidents of note. This book, by the way, is a book called For All the Saints. Uh, you can buy hard copies of it, but there's also a free PDF copy that you can download from the National Church website. And that's where a bunch of the information that I'm going to share with you from this morning comes from. So the martyrs of the 20th century, specifically three million Armenian Christians who died in the First World War, one million Orthodox Christians who perished in the Soviet Union during the 1920s and 30s. An unknown number of Albanian Christians who disappeared in their government's efforts to suppress Christianity. Hundreds of Germans, both Protestants and Catholics, who died because they resisted Hitler and the Nazi regime. Burmese Christians who were killed simply because they believed in Christ hundreds of African Christians who suffered because they condemned the terrorism of colonial authorities and black nationalists alike, and many others who were killed because their Christian witness made them oppose racism or social and economic or other injustices. And a little information about St. George. Few saints have been as widely popular as the martyr named George, a Roman soldier who suffered for the faith in the early fourth century. The circumstances of his martyrdom are obscure, but we know that the Roman authorities were worried by the number of soldiers who were secret Christians, and so they took harsh measures against them. The situation was all the more remarkable because at that time, soldiering was still seen as one of the careers which the church did not allow its members to follow, so that George was not baptized when he died. It was not unusual for people in his circumstance to delay baptism until they had retired from active service. But the church believed that by his martyrdom, George had, if anything, almost a kind of better baptism because he shared in the suffering and death of Christ himself. In later centuries, as the cult spread westwards, George became the model of a perfect Christian warrior, just the sort of figure that appealed to medieval English kings when they placed their wars of conquest under his protection. And that is how St. George came to be invoked as the patron saint of England. But another and far more widespread tradition has seen him as the pattern of what it means to be a Christian in the world as an image of every Christian's daily warfare against the forces of sin, ignorance, fear, and injustice. And briefly on St. Mark the Evangelist. References to a person named Mark or John Mark appear frequently in the New Testament. 
St. Paul, the book of Acts. They describe Mark as the cousin of Barnabas, the apostle, the son of a wealthy woman of Jerusalem, whose house was a meeting place for the disciples of Jesus. The book of Acts also says that Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, but then decided to turn back. This actually caused a division between Paul and Barnabas. It is generally agreed that Mark's is the earliest of the four Gospels. Scholars say it was written around the year 68 and probably at Rome. It was contemporary with the church's first experience of persecution by the authorities of the Roman Empire. And this may explain why of the four Gospels, Mark's version has the sharpest edge and offers the least comfort. He was addressing a church confused by the gap between the promise of the good news and the reality of the persecution. In his account, the disciples are just as blind and uncomprehending about Jesus as the Pharisees and rulers. They confess that he is the Son of God, but refuse to understand the still greater truth, that the Son of God must suffer and die. Mark, therefore, takes great pains to let his readers in on the secret so that Christians experiencing persecution would not make the same mistake. So the good shepherd, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. We see Jesus living out this image living it out to show the love he has for the disciples, to show the love that he has for God. And this is what the author of the Gospel of Mark was trying to get at and trying to have understood. And so in the fourth century along comes George, a soldier in the Roman Empire. And he too hears and understands this message, so much so that it changes his life. Again, there was that rule in the early church that you couldn't be an active serving soldier and a member of the church at the same time. So many of those soldiers, like George, who wanted to follow Jesus, would do so secretly, discreetly, and quietly. And then later, after they were freed or retired from their military service, then they would be baptized and become full members of the church. But as to many others, this was not to happen for George because he was caught in the persecutions carried out by the Roman Empire under Emperor Diocletian against those secret Christians. George, among those many others, was killed. And so he never had the chance to retire and be baptized and become a full member of the church. But there is that understanding that Baptism as a sacrament is not ours to disperse, that is God's gift to give. And so the church has considered George and all of those others to have been baptized. Now, the legends and the stories about George are many, but it was said that before he was killed, he was able to share that love of God that he understood and to tell people why he was willing to risk death for Christ and that this changed the hearts and minds of many who heard it, even possibly Empress Alexandria. And through that witness, those people who heard him chose to follow Jesus too. George's life at this point is considered to have followed very closely in Jesus' footsteps, witnessing to others about God's love and then ultimately losing his life at the hands of the Roman Empire, whom he had served. For martyrs of all ages and in all times, whether those like George from the fourth century, those who came earlier, and those who came after, like all of those in the 20th century and beyond, they are all faced with the same challenges, staying true to their faith despite what they know is coming, holding fast to that transformative love of God, which offers comfort and hope even in death. And it is in that where the image of the Good Shepherd 
who takes care of the sheep and is willing to lay down his life for them takes on this immense meaning. While knowing they would not escape physical death, trusting that the wolf Jesus promises to chase away is the good shepherd, is the devil, evil, eternal torment, and death of the soul. Trusting that that is true. The image of George as this perfect Christian warrior who fights sin, ignorance, fear, and despair is powerfully inspiring. Just as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us today our daily bread, we also pray, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. It is a part of daily life to be actively working against sin, ignorance, fear, and despair. So when it is acknowledged that no matter who we are or where we have come from or what our state in life is, that we all face those struggles. There's strength to be found in that unity. And where there is strength in that unity, there is also the strength to face all of the other challenges of life that face us. And it's said that George was born to a Greek father and a Palestinian mother. He also wasn't just a foot soldier, he was supposedly a soldier of some rank. And so he had status, he had privilege, and he had power. And he forsook all of that upon hearing and coming to understand the love of God. Now this message and this image in the face of all that he inspired in others is the same in terms of the challenges that we face and see today. This can be especially hard to hear and think about in the midst of this life that we are living together right now, in the midst of the pandemic where people are more isolated than ever, where people feel alone in their troubles and their tribulations. We are all confronted constantly by ignorance and fear and despair. And we find this every time we hear or listen or watch the news. And for some, every time we open our eyes, every waking moment for some, and even, even sleep itself. Even though our circumstances are very different in the 21st century, many today also feel that gap between the good news and the circumstances of life that they see playing out in front of them or that they are living, especially those who are living persecuted lives. The world over, not everyone lives in the same comfort with the same privileges and the same freedoms that we do here in Canada, in the North and in the West. There are people who are persecuted. There are people whose li who live lives of despair. Now, much more than ever, as we consider people the world over, as we consider people here at home and all of the troubles that we face, now more than ever, do we need that image of this mighty soldier who was brought low who faced the loss of status, power, privilege, and strength, and in the face of that, turned to that which is more powerful than all of those, the love of God. Now more than ever do we need to remember that in all suffering and distress, that none of us are alone, that all of those who have gone before us, all of those martyrs throughout time who have suffered, all of those saints of God are with us. All our ancestors, all our relations, and Christ himself. We are never alone in our suffering. Now more than ever do we need that image of the good shepherd who's willing to lay down their life for us, to search out the lost, to chase away the wolf, and who knows us 
especially in the midst of our fear and distress. In our confusion and that gap, the place between the good news and the life of the world that we see unfolding around us. Now more than ever, do we need to be reminded that all of this is held in God's love. Now more than ever, do you need to know that in the midst of all of that, you are loved. In the midst of all of that, that you are a beloved child of God. And that no matter what you face, no matter what is said about you or what you might consider yourself even, that you are too a beautiful human person made in God's own image. This may be foolishness to the world, but this is the wisdom of God, that love is what will build us up, heal and restore us, and ultimately will save us. It saved a Roman soldier. It saved countless martyrs in the 20th century and throughout all time. This is the love that sustained them. This is the love that inspired them and continues to inspire us. This is the love that inspired the community that received and shared the gospel of Mark. And this is the love that resides in this community of St. George's and in every gathering of Christians everywhere and beyond. As imperfect and human, as broken as we are, that this is the love that leads and pushes us ever onwards in our walk to follow Jesus, to find that healing, that redemption, that restoration, and ultimately that life in God.